Okay, let me ask this question. I'll ask both of you, and I'll start with Anthony. Do we see $50 cannabis stocks one day if legislation moves in the U.S.? Yeah, without question. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Thanks for checking into our Trade of Black podcast this week. I'm your host, Shad Dales. We're going to get right into it, talk stock market news, talk about cannabis, pretty dead right now. Crypto, we're seeing some hackers come in. And most importantly, the S&P 500. Is the stock rally going to live on or is it shortly fizzled out? We're going to find all that before we get into this week's podcast. All views on the Trade to Black podcast and the guests on this podcast are pure the opinion. You should not treat any opinions expressed by us or our guests as investment advice. The views on this podcast are solely intended to be informational and are not investment advice. Okay, let's begin. Welcome in millennial entrepreneur and the founder of Only Gems, Anthony Vero. How are you, sir? Good day. Good. Good. How's it Good. Going? It's, uh, everything's going up again, which is kind of a weird feeling. Um, I mean, you're seeing like the shit meme stocks go up, NFTs are going up, crypto's going up. Um, I don't know what's going on, but it's it's, it's pleasant surprise. I'm not gonna hate. I'm not. I don't hate it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's gonna be short lived. Okay, let's get into that in a bit. Lead financial no writer Ben Smith at TDR. Good to see you, Ben. Good to be here. Thanks, Shad. Uh, yeah, crazy markets going up again. Uh, direction is unclear, but we'll get into that in a second. <laughs> So let's dive right into what you said, Anthony. Uh, everything is going up. Why do you think everything is, is it's, I guess, you how do you explain it? It's like, why are things going up? I don't really have an answer, to be honest. I mean, Powell hasn't really come out and said he's going to stop raising rates. Powell hasn't come out and said he's going to lower rates. I mean, the macro is still in the same, uh, in the same state that it's been everything's just kind of catching a bit right now. I mean, like I said, I'm not going to complain, but I'm very, very cautious. Ben, any feedback on why you think it's moving and going up? Yeah, I think there's this, uh, the the stock market is a forward-looking vehicle. So I think people are, are looking at, you know, perhaps the tea leaves and looking at six to nine months ahead, thinking that, you know, rates are going to stop or slow or perhaps even come down. And, uh, you know, liquidity conditions are going to get better in the market. And, I don't know if that's really the right assumption right now, but that's what everybody's rolling with. So they're bidding up the market. Uh, perhaps they don't think earnings will be as bad uh, or a recession will take place. So there is optimism. I don't know if it's founded though. So if this... Yeah, it almost makes me, it almost makes me want to go short that everybody's getting bullish mm. again um, out of nowhere and nothing's really yeah. changed. Yeah. So... Sorry, go ahead, Chuck. Go ahead, Ben. No, I was just going to say, no, like, ahead. you know, fundamentally, I think there's uh, like probably three main reasons why I would be very skeptical of this market, like I talked about last week. Um, and that is, first of all, the, P the, the median P.E., price to earnings ratio of the market right now is over 18. Historically, uh, the levels yeah. are, should be around like in an average market is around 17. So we're above the normal historical P, uh, P.E. ratio. And there's zero er earnings growth or even negative earnings growth to come this quarter. Right. So what are you exactly paying for? Right. What are you paying? For? So, when, yeah, when you say price to earnings ratio 18 uh, for newbies that are trying to understand the uh, market, and the economy, maybe go into details to what that means. Yeah, that that's uh, a very common multiple, uh, a ratio that uh, indicates a multiple for a stock that you're paying for the amount of earnings that they produce for the S&P 500, for example. So, um there are obviously many different metrics that you can use, but price to earnings is one of the main ones. And uh, right now it is above the, what the historical median average is for the market, despite the fact that earnings are going to be flat to perhaps negative two or 3% this quarter. So really you're paying that yeah. above historical yeah. uh, multiple for earnings growth that is flat to perhaps negative this quarter and probably for the next uh, two or three quarters ahead. Okay. So, yeah, I think the major the major theme is going to be how are they guiding for the back half of this right. year? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's what people are looking <laughs> we're for hearing more right in the market because they're looking at you know will the recession end? Yeah. Uh, will rates come down? But like we said last week, or I've been saying for the last couple of weeks, that even if Powell lower rates tomorrow, historically, the market is down in the weeks or you know three to four months following. Uh, a decline in interest rates because that means that usually the economy is very bearish and it prompts the Fed to lower rates. So you, there's a there's a delayed or lagging effect, and you probably want to wait for that scenario anyway. If, if if Powell says he's going to lower rates tomorrow, it's probably not the time to jump into the market right then. It's, you probably there's a the delayed effect historically 
uh, when the market goes up after uh, rates are lowered. Anthony, what do you think happens as far as interest rates? Your guess is as good as mine, to be honest. Um, I mean, I think that they moderated the back half of this year. I don't think they raise again, um, but I don't think they're going to lower anytime soon. I mean, I think he still wants to see more unemployment kind of crack. I mean, you're seeing it across the tech stocks and the mega caps. Um, I mean, everyone from Goldman Sachs to to Google to um, Apple hasn't fired anybody yet. Um, Tim Cook just took a $50 million pay cut, which is kind of crazy because now he's only making $49 million uh, this year versus the $99. Um, that he was supposed to make. Um, but I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see. I mean, I think there's a lot of uncertainty and uh, it's Powell's hopefully he does the right thing. For those that are trying to understand, you'd think tech, you know, would be a booming industry, especially over the past, you know, it's like 12 to 18 months. It, why does this industry, why has it been hit so hard? It's, it is still a booming industry. Um, the companies are just how, however, realizing right now that they need to right size. Um, They need to get an efficient model. They need to focus on profitability um, versus growth. I mean, it was the Amazon model across the board with all mega cap tech, grow at all costs, higher, higher, higher. They're now figuring out that they don't need all of these bodies to grow and they don't need all of these operations people and marketing people. And now they're right sizing. Once they right size and they figure out how to juice that bottom line even more than it is, then they're going to take off to the upside. Well, you, you bring up a good point. Microsoft, they purported a slowdown, including their cloud computing business. Not sure if you guys know much about that, which is uh, was a yeah. disappointment yeah. Uh, for some investors who were counting on the software company to be relatively resistant due to a potential recession. But is this a great example as to what you're alluding to? The slowdown in cloud? Yeah. Um, no, not as eh, far as profitability kind of, and because, expansion I mean, slowdown, is what I'm referring to. Yeah. Slowdown, slowdown in cloud for like slowdown in Azure for Microsoft, slowdown in AWS for Amazon. I mean, that's a, not a condemnation on, but I mean, it's more so a data point of, well, maybe enterprise is slowing. And if enterprise is slowing, it means the consumer slowing. And then ultimately their, their, their business, their, their, their profitability and their revenue is going to slow. Um, as well. I mean, I know that a lot of analysts are actually looking at those cloud numbers and see those cloud numbers as the barometer of how well they're doing um, in their uh, in, in their businesses. Um, I think it's a certain function of it, but I think also is these companies just hired and hired and hired. Facebook hired an obscene amount of people in the last uh, two to three years. And now it's just slash, figure out your productivity metrics and go. I mean, Salesforce fired a bunch of people um, last week and yeah. the stock's ripping. The last, uh, yeah. the last quite a days. few companies. So did, is actually. this, a- um, and uh, I mean, there's there's been uh, probably at least at least a couple dozen, right? From everybody from Amazon to Microsoft, as you said, CRM, Salesforce, a lot of them are. So uh, if that that should really tell the average investor where big tech thinks the economy is going, if they're slashing headcount to this degree. And we're not just talking about a few hundred jobs here and there, but the small firms there, there has been. But we're talking about five digit job slashes in some of the big tech companies. So they're, they're reading yeah. the tea leaves and they're understanding that the economy is slowing down capacity as you see it in server growth uh, on the cloud. That tells you that uh, they're not investing as much in CapEx because perhaps they think that they're not as, as much capacity will be brought on in the months ahead, right? So that should tell you where you want to know as an investor, where are these big companies, are, what, what are these big companies doing as opposed to what they're saying? And clearly they, they see some sort of slowdown coming. So if we see, like we've heard rumors of some of the people that we've spoken to about how the recession is actually going to be a lot more mild than what people were first originally thinking. Where are we, uh, do you think, come Q3, uh, Q4 of this year then, Ben, if that is indeed, if that does happen? I, I don't know. Personally, I'm on the fence of whether it's going to be mild or a hard recession. Uh, you know, you start to hear a little bit more about, it, you know, a soft landing. Maybe it's more mild, but I think it's really hard to predict right now. Um, if I had to guess, I would probably say it's more on the mild side and maybe it's just more of a typical recession. It's not some sort of like yeah. 2008 style crash, <clears throat> uh, but it, it's really hard to say right now. Either, either way, uh, if earnings growth is going to go down, if there's still a delayed effect from the Fed, I'm with Anthony uh, about interest rates. I, I don't. I think the Fed's going to hike at least a couple more times, 25 basis points. So we're not even at the end of the rate uh, tightening cycle yet. Um, so, mm-hmm. you know, I tend to think that it will probably be a, a mild recession, but I, I really don't know. I think it's too early to tell. Okay. 
All right, let's shift now to crypto. You talked about everything being up, Anthony. Bitcoin, uh, just on fire lately, uh, rising through $22,000 resistance and close to 40% in two weeks uh, from the time Jim Cramer advised investors to sell. So you said last week as well, tread lightly. Do you still have the same sentiment or are you a believer in this current rally? I'm still treading lightly. Um, I mean, after thinking about it, I mean, we're really just back to the pre-FTX levels. Um, before that whole thing blew up and there was all that FUD that was going on um, and people thought there were going to be mass liquidations. We went from 16 to 12, traded sideways at 12 on Ethereum. Bitcoin was just bouncing around. I mean, they're back to those levels. Can they break out even higher? Not sure. It's going to depend on what the NASDAQ does um, and what the macro does um, for now as they are directly coupled. Um, but I mean, I'm seeing a lot of people making money in NFTs right now. I mean, there's a lot of collections that have come out in the past two, three, four weeks that are up 10 X's, um, that people are just piling that money back in. So, I mean, if things like that keep happening and the markets are, are healthy and efficient and there's not another FTX or a black swan event. Yeah. I think Ethereum can go 2k, um, start to get some legs and, and really move. You talked about how it all depends on how the NASDAQ performs, uh, educate us on how that correlates to like the crypto and more specifically Bitcoin. Yeah, it's risk, it's risk on. Um, if there's if there's risk on appetite in the market, crypto is going to get money. It's going to get institutional money. It's going to garner interest um, from from people, and, and it's going to go higher. I mean, what one thing that we've seen is Bitcoin and Ethereum. They don't need a lot uh, to move. So once that really snow, once that snowball start and the momentum starts, it's it, it just it's self perpetuating. It's, it's people FOMO in, people just start piling in, and then you see it make parabolic moves. Um, it's all about confidence. I mean, I think a lot of people have already forgotten about FTX. Um, and it's I, like I said, I'm, I'm cautious, but it's, uh, so the it's, fact it's looking that, good. The fact that crypto um, as far is as, correlated uh, with equities, uh, you know, I would love for it to get to a time where crypto acts a little bit more like gold and it's considered a store of value. But you basically you're saying that it, it's a risk on asset. Yeah. It's going to follow equities. And, and it has from, you know, in, in recent historically, basically. Um, so hopefully like, do, do you foresee a time where it's yeah. going to be more like a gold and just trade a little bit more stably, less volatile and ha stop having this huge correlation with, with, with the stock market? Trade like gold and across the board. No, I mean, I think Bitcoin can, I think Bitcoin probably will moving forward. Ethereum. I mean, Ethereum's a technology. Ethereum is, is a, it's a platform technology. It should trade in theory. It trades like a NASDAQ stock. Um, I mean, Ethereum software, uh, the tokens that you're buying are just leveraged to inter, uh, transacting in that ecosystem. So I don't see Ethereum acting in that way or any of the other altcoins. The only crypto that I think is absolutely analogous to gold and can be considered a store of value is Bitcoin. Will it decouple eventually? Probably. Um, but I think gold is a great bet right now. So I think if gold rips higher, I'm very curious to see if Bitcoin follows. You've said crypto investors have moved on from FTX based on this recent rally. Why do you think that? Very short memories. I mean, everything from Web3 to crypto. I mean, uh, headlines kind of take over for, let's say, a 48-hour cycle, and then they're gone. Sam Bankman's finally gone from Twitter. No one's mentioning him. No one's talking about FTX. There hasn't been any hacks within the last, let's say, six weeks, knock on wood. I mean, that's a short period of time, but people have very short memories and people want yield. People want to find places to park cash and to put money in right now. And a lot of people that are interacting with the crypto ecosystem, they don't trust the stock market, mm -hmm. whether it's flashing green signals or not. Um, so, I mean, I think it's it's short memory. Uh, people forget and, and people are, are willing to, to jump mm. in and start to figure out ways to uh But do you think that that's interact the problem how that people have a short memory? I mean, look what happens. <clears throat> I mean, how can, you know, the biggest companies, a big, one of the biggest exchanges in the world just neglected its fiduciary duty to its investors? And how, how can people forget something like that so quickly? Correct. But that wasn't a crypto problem. That was a people mm -hmm. problem. Not correct. But it, like that the, was the exchanges that, are what. Yeah. Like if anything, if anything, the system worked. Okay, so what, so what you're saying just, is crypto Sam just took should be the way to large go. gross advantage of it. So the what? what you're saying is that the, if, if you're going to get into crypto, should I dive into an exchange like Binance or should I hold something off chain? I personally hold all of my coins, tokens off chain in a cold storage wallet, custo custodied by myself. The average person, though, can't do that. I mean, if I was going to 
dabble in crypto right now, you buy Coinbase. I think Coinbase is just as good as E-Trade, TD Ameritrade, Fidelity. Um, your stuff is relatively safe there. They don't have derivative products. They don't have any sort of these uh, elaborate exotic staking products that are giving out this 8 to 10% yield. Um, that being said, talking about Black Swan stuff, there's still a big question mark around what's going to happen with Gemini and the Bitcoin and Ethereum trusts um, from Grayscale, as well as the digital asset group. So, I mean, that can come back into the fold and then wreck the little bit of momentum that we've had. But I mean, that's yet to be uh, that's yet to be seen. Anthony, how would you and this is uh, um, just a big just an overall question for people that are like getting into the, this crypto space. But how would you best describe uh, the trading habits or personalities of a crypto investor? What do you mean? Like they move quick that like you are saying that they have short term memory. They've moved on to FTX um, where I'm going with this is just like, what are the pros and cons as to some of the trading habits uh, within like what you're seeing as far as trend? I don't. Yeah. I mean, I don't mm-hmm. think the the average person should be trading crypto. I think the average person should be allocating capital on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis to crypto, putting it in the side in their portfolio and letting it mm-hmm. sit. If you believe in Bitcoin and Ethereum, Put $1,000 a month, put $5,000 a quarter um, into the position, keep stacking it to the side and just let it sit. The average person right now with the way the user experience is, the way security issues are, the way these markets move, you're going to lose a lot of money if you think you can just fire up a Coinbase account and start trading Mm -hmm. everything from XRP to Matic to Chainlink to to Ethereum. Um, The average person shouldn't be doing that right now. That's an easy way to lose. Are you money. still seeing that uh, in the event? Like, um, well, let's 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 face it. Everything that's happened over the past few months. But are, do you still see that trend happening? Uh, or as you said in the past, the idiots are gone. They want to see uh, transparency. Oh no, there, there's still there's still people trading. I mean, I've traded a couple. I've made a couple trades in the past two weeks that I'm up eight ten x on on uh on things that i minted and then on things that i picked up on the secondary market there's plenty of people that are doing that mm-hmm. um all of the collections like board ape yacht club put a new nft out last week i think it's traded around 3800 ethereum in the last 24 hours volume wise i mean that's a testament to the market that's a it's pretty impressive mm. um the the nft yeah. market's alive and well i mean the crypto market's alive and well but like i said if you're the average person or you're a novice and you're tiptoeing in don't try to get fancy. Take it slow. Figure out what you want to do. Figure out what you're comfortable doing. And then if you really just want exposure to it as part of your portfolio, take a take an allocated amount of capital every month, put it in there, put it to the side, and just let it sit because your time horizon on this stuff really should be long if your thesis is to make a decent amount of money on it. And a so good how are return. the NFT volumes? Yep. Uh, are they picking up? I know they crashed uh, in, the, in the time period. They're, pick- they're all picking they're up. All picking up. Um, they're, they're all picking up across the board. Um, I didn't think it was going to be this quick, but I mean, NFTs right now are, are moving. I mean, there, there's money being made again, which is nice. All right. Let's now shift to cannabis. Uh, not a lot going on. MSOs dead as a doornail with sediment completely muted right now. Um, what should we expect Ben, uh, as far as long term? um, what's your, what's your take on this whole thing right now? Well, everything's obviously dead right now. I've never seen personally the chatter uh, so subdued on social media platforms like Twitter. Uh, The conversation is completely dead right now. Uh, Like we talked about earlier, uh, you know, the air got sucked out of the room with the expectations of safe banking, federal reform in the lame duck session, how that got kiboshed for the second year in a row. Um, So after that, I think it was pretty clear especially coming on uh, on the back of the uh, of the Cowan warning from Viz- Vivian Azer uh, saying that she didn't expect any uh, reform to happen in the uh, 118th Congress. I think people have seen that as long as Schumer and McConnell remain the Senate majority leaders for each respective party, nothing is going to happen in this Congress, right? Until they so are gone. We, we know that, but what, what, 
what is forward thinking statements? What happens to this industry this year? So what happens is uh, what you're seeing now, not a lot of chatter. I think uh, what, what's setting up is um, some sort of perhaps long-term pancake bottom where sentiment is uh, not there. There's no expectations and uh, the equity markets sort of languish for, for a bit in what you call uh, like a pancake bottom where it just, it goes within a narrow range uh, scurrying along the bottom for a prolonged period of time because the market cannot move. The industry cannot move from a capital markets perspective until we get that reform. I mean, th that much is clear. Yeah. Uh, so I don't see anything coming out of Congress because uh, you know, the, the house is now GOP and uh, they don't, you know, uh, they don't want necessarily any bills to uh, the Democrats to get any wins uh, leading into the 2024 election. So I don't expect a lot of activity right now, unfortunately. Anthony, do you think these stocks will stay flat to where they are now, or do you think they'll continue to uh, decline? I think they stay flat, but I mean, I hate to say this because I really do enjoy speaking about cannabis and I enjoy reading about the cannabis industry, but I think this investment class right now is completely uninvestable. Yeah um until there's some sort of movement and i don't think that's going to happen anytime mm -hmm. soon like i'm with ben like no one's fucking talking about cannabis no one's excited about anything if you like the industry if you're a, if you're a consumer stay on course do your thing but as far as invest the investability of these assets right now i can't give anybody or myself a good reason as to why i would put capital to work into these yeah. stocks well, I was on LinkedIn last week. Um, there is a highly reputable person within the industry that posted on why uh, there's been uh, so many quality people leaving the industry in droves. Uh, some of the reasons yeah. explained are weak leadership and culture, cold, hard industry realities. The compensation isn't great. Legislation stalling. So um, one, I can't, ha can't help but believe a lot of that stuff is true. Um, the common question is, is like, what's the kind of impact uh, this is going to have on companies? Obviously, this is negative. I guess the first question, Anthony, do you believe a lot of this stuff that I just outlined regarding the industry? Um, I would like to see who's complaining about salaries and cannabis, because I know damn well what a lot of people are making. And it sure as hell were large salaries. Ex um, if anything, Executive members, but everyday people in the business. What are, so you mean like bud yeah. tenders? Well, it could be. I, I, I mean, they don't make, I mean, they sit there and they're a glorified fucking cashier. I mean, what, how much do you think they're going to make? Mm -hmm. They're probably going to make 15 bucks an hour. And I mean, that's how you run an efficient business. Unfortunately, I'm not saying pay the minimum wage, but they're not going to make a hundred grand a year. Um, and that's just not it. Um, I think you can probably say that we're getting to the idiots are gone phase in the cannabis industry where you're going to get a lot of the pure play capital markets guys and like charlatans that basically just saw dollar signs and flooded in. They're probably going to leave um, now. But I mean, the sad part is, is they're probably juiced up with options. They've made a shitload of money and extracted a ton of value from these companies. And now they're going to hand them off to someone else's problem, which is why I would probably, if I was going to invest money today, stick with a company like Canopy those executives aren't going anywhere. They've got Constellation at their back. They've got assets in the United States. They've got assets in Canada. And they know the hardest trick of the trade, and that's distribution. Um, so, I mean, I would stick to someone like that. But, I mean, I think there's truth to everything you just said to a certain degree. I think it's also a lot of people complaining. But if you want to jump in in the green rush and then you just want to jump out as soon as it stagnates, you weren't really here for the right reasons in the first place. What do you say about Canopy, though? A lot of feedback. The product isn't great. They have to change that. But with the backing of Constellation, you think they get that fixed? Obviously, they do. I think the product gets better. I mean, they think they can. I mean, if anything, they've got the capital and they've got the staying power to where they can pick up some of these failed companies. Um, I mean, I think the, not, the knock on Canopy is, is their product sucks in Canada. Look at Gage. Gage, I think TerraSend is going to get rolled into this whole Canopy USA holdings mm. sooner or later. Gage's product is is A1. Um, their cookies product that's in Michigan, the rest of their products that are rolled out in Michigan are great cannabis mm. products. TerraSend's other products across the US that I've had, they're pretty good. Um, I don't think any of the companies or any of the US affiliates of Canopy have a problem growing good mm. product from what I've seen.
Ben, what do you think of the overall industry? Um, besides from all the stuff that's going on in Washington, but are there things that I, can, I guess maybe grab your attention as to what you think might need to change regarding the industry? Just simply reform. I mean, that that's all. That's the be all end all from a capital markets perspective. Without reform, it doesn't go anywhere. So, um, you know, I would be looking at, it, you know, if you're still interested in the industry, a lot of the times, the best times to buy are actually periods like this where interest is low and things skirt along the bottom, right? Because that uh, ends up being a good accumulation phase for uh, something to ha- you know to kick in later on, and then you're you're buying low. So you, you just have to be very patient. But uh, right now, on my radar, uh, in terms of you know actionable events, uh, it's very very limited right now. I think you just have to it's, you know just wait it through. And if you're a bull long term, just, you know, pick up shares when you can dollar cost average and, uh, you know, build a position, uh, slowly over time. Do you think, yeah, I mean, like I, like I said with crypto, um, just buy set to the side and set it and forget it. And I mean, this isn't financial advice, but canopy sitting around two fifty. the risk reward there's pretty nice, Mm -hmm. um, to just stack it, put it to the side, And just wait. And I think a lot um, of people like they, they make the mistake of they, they dollar cost average because they think uh, in boom times where the, the, the industry is going to take off right away and they dollar cost average a little bit too early. Right now, if you're thinking about doing that again, not yeah. investment advice, but now is the time to dollar cost average when things are at its lowest. Right. Where all the downside is basically almost priced in. I mean, MSOs could go down to five, could go four and a half or, or whatnot. But I mean, most of the move is priced in. If you're dollar cost averaging when MSOs is at 45, then uh, you know it's going to have to go up like, dude. You know, and your dollar cost average is say 25 over time. It's going to have to make a, like a six to seven hundred percent move for you to get your money back, or 500 percent move, right? Now, if you're dollar cost averaging now with everything almost basically all the downside priced in, uh, you're in a lot yeah. better shape. Hmm. All right. Um... We'll end it there. I see a smirk on your face, Anthony, but we'll just end it there. Yeah, I was just thinking, I was just looking at the date and I actually had calls that expired this Friday that were $33 <laughs> calls in MSOS. Um, granted, wow. I, I got rid of them in December, but they were, I bought them in like August, but they were they were calls that were going to expire this week, this Friday. So um, I remember it. Here, Ben, say four, a four or $5 <clears throat> handle. Um, on it, just I remember the uh, three of us at MJ Biz in 2021, October of 2021, and the prices that we were looking at back then. It is just mind. You know, I thought it was going to be 50. A lot of people now. did. Yeah, I think we all. A lot did. of people did. The the call volume there yeah. was, uh, you know, on on uh, the calls uh, in 2023 and leaps were you know, like six to one, seven to one uh, calls to puts. So yeah, yeah. a lot of people were, were thinking that reform was going to happen, right? And they were betting on that and getting that you know, premium if it came through. And of course it didn't. So. Okay. Let me ask this question. I'll ask both of you and I'll start with Anthony. Do we see $50 cannabis stocks one day if legislation moves in the U S yeah, without question. Yeah? Do we see hundred dollar stocks? Yeah. I mean, would you talk about MSOS, MSOS, true leaf, uh, all the big, uh, four or five MSOs. Do we see hundred dollar stocks? Um, I mean, I'm trying to think of where a hundred dollar share price would put True Leaf in the billions. Uh, Cure Leaf, no. no. I mean, that'd be they'd have like a thirty billion dollar yeah. market cap. I think if it's a hundred dollar, hundred dollar. But share regardless price. of the company, you think um, those days? I think if we if we get legalization, MSOS is going from five to fucking thirty to forty dollars, um, pretty quickly. I think you start because like like we've said. I mean, I don't want to sound like a broken record here, but it's safe. I mean, it's can institutional capital invest mm-hmm. in the space? Mm-hmm. Can the stocks that are reflective of U.S. operators get purchased by institutions and wealth managers? Will Are the gloves being taken off and 280E being um, slashed out, declassified, and is safe going to be a real thing? If it is, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, MSOS is easily back to 30, 40 mm-hmm. bucks. Um, I mean, these companies aren't, failing they're just they've hit a concrete wall that unfortunately is pretty much an immovable object right now with the way that the u.s government's set up yeah and that's back to uh ben's point 
Um, all right, gents. Uh, good perspective on everything. Uh, any surprises from past weekend? Uh, obviously, the Cowboys still suck. Dak Prescott, if you're Jerry Jones, well, he's not going to do anything because he thinks Jerry Jones is Tom Brady. But uh, if you're if you're owner of the Dallas Cowboys, what do you do with Dak Prescott? Prescott's got a problem. They got Jerry I, Jones has a problem because I watched all that game, and uh, you know. Obviously, San Fran's a really good team, but he's losing to Brock Purdy, you know, the Mr. Uh, last draft pick and Mr. Irrelevant, as they call him. You know, he's a good player. Obviously, you can't just go based on draft pick. But, I mean, it, Prescott is a seasoned, supposedly tier one QB, and he got outplayed by, by Purdy, uh, hands down, right? Brock Purdy's undefeated. No, I, 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 I get in that, but NFL you're in the career. playoffs, and you're a tier one QB he, making, what, 30 or $35 million a year, you got 40, or was it 40? 40 million. Okay. You got to be pretty. You got to be pretty. And the, there's several throws that he, he missed in the fourth quarter. I think he missed Gallup who would have been open. He could broke yeah, one there. He, he threw it behind him and the two, the two and he picks. had the two picks and he didn't convert when they had that fumble on the 15 yard line. He couldn't punch it in. They sell for a field goal. These are the things you have to do as a premium quarterback in the NFL. And he failed. And he played a great team, granted. But yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I believe. I, I, I agree with you, Ben, completely. I just think the Cowboys are the Cowboys. They can't do anything. I think they're going to have to fire Mike McCarthy. I think they're going to have to put in. I mean, you can't. What, what are you going to do? Get another elite receiver? Ceedee Lamb just had a, a a record year for himself. He's an elite receiver in the in yeah, the yeah mock drafts. Are um, they've got a kid from Tennessee as uh, probably their first round pick. They'll they'll get a receiver, but it's just if you yeah. if you lose Dan Quinn, you're not going to be a better team next year because Dan Quinn really is the head no. coach to that team. So you got to bring in Sean Payton. Hopefully that happens for Cowboys fans. But to Ben's point, Brock Purdy did look like uh, deer in headlights at times in the first half. And when you're when you're yeah. driving down the field in the red zone, and Dak Prescott throws a terrible interception, uh, it's a valid point. T- being a tier one quarterback making forty million a year, you've got to score a touchdown there to have momentum going into the second half because they the victory was there for them. But again, in grand cowboy fashion, yeah. uh, choke at the worst the time. The defense played well enough. Yeah, I mean the Niners didn't win. The, defense the Cowboys played yeah, well that's enough exactly to win, it. and and Dak Prescott couldn't score twenty points. And yeah. I was impressed with my boy Joe Burrow Ooh. going into Buffalo. Wow. And absolutely torching Best. them. I think yeah. if me personally, I know I picked the Niners, so I don't want to be sound like, but after watching a full game and then watching the Eagles and Giants, uh, that Eagles team looks unreal. I think the. I think it's going to be Eagles. Eagles that, what, a, what a Super Bowl that'll be. But think about this. Yeah. You've got Joe Burrow, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, uh, Trevor Lawrence now coming. Um and why am I drawing a blank? The quarterback for the Chargers, Justin, Justin Herbert. Herbert, like five premium legit quarterbacks in one conference. It's crazy. Whoa, 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 whoa! Don't 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 be dogging my boy Tua like that. <laughs> don't don't I, forget don't don't forget the stats. Don't forget the stats that Tua put up when he was. Healthy I do like look. If he was completely healthy, I would say he's in that class. I just worry that that guy's career could be over like the next hit he endures. That's, that's the only thing that concerns me with him. Potentially. But I mean, when we're, when we're talking about talent, I mean, no. look at Tua's numbers compared to everybody you just named. I don't like Tua's talent yeah. to be on it. Like he, he, he's got talent insofar as that he, no, what, what I mean by that, let me clarify. What I mean is that he has talent insofar as a very accurate and he's a good timing passer. But if you put him in some offenses, I think he's a byproduct of his offense in a lot of ways and getting two premium tier one best in NFL receivers. If you put him in a standard offense, he doesn't have the arm. He can't make all those throws. He's got a noodle arm. Let's face it. He's got a, he's got a below average arm. Yeah, but he's got a noodle arm that could hit a lottery ticket sitting in the end zone from from 45 feet away sitting on a fucking tripod. Yeah, he is. I mean, you can't make you can't say that if you put him on a mediocre team, he'd be a mediocre quarterback. He's on a mediocre. Not yeah. one of those two receivers, yeah. he isn't. No, no, no. I'm saying it, what you just said. If you put him on a mediocre team, he would be a mediocre quarterback. I mean, you can't dog him saying that. Oh, he's got Jalen Waddle and Tyreek Hill, so he's he's that yeah. good. I mean, he's hitting those guys on a rope. Yeah. He is yeah, accurate. Time. I'll, I'll grant you. I'm just commenting more on his arm strength, and I, I realize arm strength isn't the be all end all, but. Uh, 
I mean, look at Drew Brees. Drew Brees had a decent yeah. career. Yeah. Didn't have the strongest arm, but he was accurate as hell. All right, NFL mock draft. Do you take Bryce Young over C.J. Stroud? <laughs> I don't take either you of them. You don't. Why? No. Why? Because do those guys... Name me an Ohio State quarterback that's translated well <laughs> into the NFL. And the only one that you could say, and he's technically a Ohio State quarterback, is Joe yeah. Burrow. Yeah. And that's because he transferred to LSU. All the other guys, Terrell Pryor was, what, a wide receiver. Cardell Jones moved to fullback. JT um, Barrett. Uh, JT Troy Barrett. Brian Smith. Hoyer. Yeah. I mean, granted, you could say Bryce Young – analogous to Jalen Hurts, but I think Jalen Hurts is an anomaly. Um, I don't. I also think that Jalen Hurts is a lot better than Bryce Young. Um, I don't touch either of them. I'm taking uh, Jalen Carter from Georgia. But or, or I'm taking, who is it? The, the edge rusher from Alabama. Will Anderson. Those are, yeah, those are both game-changing. Jalen uh, Carter, well, the Bears got the top pick. They're not, obviously, they're set at quarterback, yeah. but... Jalen Carter, wow, 300 and some odd pounds, yeah. and he moves like a running back. He has got yeah. Jalen Carter. Jalen Carter is going to be Aaron Donald. Yeah, I, I believe that. So yeah. he's a generational talent. You take him. Detroit doesn't Detroit have a really high Sixth draft pick, too? Pick. Like you yeah. add in an edge rusher. Uh, there's a couple guys. Uh, Miles, what's his last name from Clemson? Um, it's the, the, the defensive players this year. Yeah. Stacked. But. That's one team. You're I don't touch the Colts. I keep saying it a couple the weeks Colts ago. Gonna... If somebody told me, well, sorry, no, I was going to say ben. the Colts are going to move up to the first pick. You're going to see Chicago trade down yeah. because they don't need a quarterback. They're going to stick with Fields, and I predict that the Colts are going to trade up because they only have to move from four. They'll give them a, a first round or whatever. The second, they'll move because oh. they want their they want they Fields. need a quarterback because they the last three or four years. Do you think the Bears been were stringing along and it hasn't worked out for them? They're going to get their quarterback. But then you uh, you have Arizona slipping at number three, and they'll pick probably Jalen Carter before Chicago. That that'll be interesting though. Fields Fields is an Ohio State quarterback, so oh, yes, yeah. there's one. So there's there's one, and I would consider Justin Fields after last year with the limited weapons that he had. Justin Fields is potentially an elite quarterback. Sounds like we should hit the road and go to the draft, do a podcast. What do you think? Is it in Vegas? No, again? it's in Kansas City, I think. Okay, pass. But hey, regardless of where it is, hey, the Kansas, draft. That, Kansas City's got some good food. Kansas City's got oh, some good yeah. food. Oh yeah, that draft last year in Vegas, that was insane. That was. Yeah, and I knew, knew a lot of people that went, and uh, let's just say there wasn't a lot of sober people there. But why would there be? It's Vegas, guys. Appreciate yeah. the time. Uh, we'll check back with you later this week. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Talk Take to you care. guys. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. 2023 is here, and right now, a lot of uncertainty pertaining to the markets, especially new emerging industries like crypto, cannabis, psychedelics, and more. So leave a comment below and let us know who you want us to interview, what are the questions that you want asked, and most importantly, what's the information that you want to learn? Once we produce these videos, then share this to your network, subscribe to our channel, and click on that bell for all notifications because we would not be here without you. Thanks for watching, everyone.